Hello and welcome to Axis Asia. Coming up, China vows reunification and Taiwan pledges to fight for sovereignty. Relations between the two are at their lowest in 40 years. Kandahar is Afghanistan's religious hub and its vast poppy fields supply the world with heroin. We look at life in the birthplace of the Taliban. And the South Korean series Squid Game is the most popular show in more than 90 countries. We look at the craze without giving away any spoilers. Well, China and Taiwan have entered dangerous territory. Beijing regards the latter as a breakaway province and has vowed peaceful reunification. But Taiwan's leaders say it is a sovereign state. The self-ruled island is a source of tension between China and the U.S. And it is also strategically important with its maritime borders. Admiral Maxwell takes a quick look at Taiwan's history. It's one of the few events that unite Taiwan with China. The 1911 revolution, led by Sun Yat-sen, that ultimately brought about the collapse of almost three centuries of China's last imperial dynasty. Commemorated as National Day in Taiwan, it also established the Republic of China, which would, at the end of the Chinese Civil War in 1949, be beaten back by Mao Zedong's Communist Party and retreat to Taiwan. The Republic of China is still the island's formal name, and the two sides have been ruled separately since then. In the decades that followed, Taiwan experienced rapid economic growth, becoming known as one of the four Asian tigers. But its 23 million people have lived under the constant threat of invasion by authoritarian China, which views the island as its territory. Chinese President Xi Jinping used the revolution's commemoration to vow to pursue their reunification. The historic task of the complete reunification of the motherland must be fulfilled, and it will be fulfilled. Those who forget their ancestors, betray the motherland, and split the country have never ended well. The UN and most Western nations continued to recognize Taiwan as the sole legitimate government of China until the early 1970s. But as the Cold War cooled, most countries switched diplomatic relations to the People's Republic of China. Since then, Taiwan has repeatedly rejected Beijing's offer of a one country, two systems form of governance, i.e. the way it rules Hong Kong. Most Taiwanese feel they effectively live in a separate nation, whether or not independence is ever officially declared. I don't think we can accept reunification with China. Just look at what happened in Hong Kong. I hope for the status quo for the future. While having no official relations with Taiwan, some Western nations have been stepping up economic and military cooperation with the island, especially the United States. It passed a new law in 2019 that aims not only to strengthen its own ties with Taiwan, but also to encourage other nations to do the same. Afghanistan supplies uh, most of the world's heroin and the epicenter of the country's drug trade as well as its spiritual hub are found in the same province. Kandahar, the birthplace of the Taliban, a land under Sharia law and an economy fueled by the drug trade. Out in the streets of Kandahar, it's impossible to find a woman who is not wearing a burqa. To get around, many of them travel in the trunks of cars while men take their place on seats. There isn't much resistance to the Taliban here. The province is dominated by the Pashtun ethnic group, who are largely supportive of the militants. Of course, we're very happy since the Taliban took over. We feel safer. The Taliban have said restoring security in Afghanistan is their priority. In this prison, the militants have been rounding up drug users many of them men and teenage boys, who have taken heroin. People who take drugs break everything. They disturb people. That's why we put them in prison. Afghanistan is the world's largest exporter of heroin. Officially, the Taliban have said that they will ban the cultivation of opium, as they did when they were last in power. But in markets across Kandahar, opium is still sold by the kilo on a daily basis. Many of the farmers know the Taliban partly funded its insurgency with the drug trade. A large part of Afghanistan's population depend on opium cultivation. If the Taliban and the international community help us, then we can stop. But if we don't harvest the opium, we don't eat, so we have to continue. At the heart of their policies, this man, 
the Taliban's supreme leader Mullah Akunzada. He's rarely seen in public for security reasons. The Americans are violating our airspace. They fly drones to target our supreme leader. They're a constant threat to him. The supreme leader also gives guidelines for the education system. Since the Taliban took over, the only thing on the curriculum is memorizing the Quran. Afghanistan's new rulers have promised more moderate governance since their last stint in power. But in the Taliban heartland of Kandahar, like much of the rest of the country, some are still fearful for the future. The exhibition in a new museum in Indonesia does not hang on the walls. It is the walls themselves. There's no brick, there's no mortar. It's built entirely out of plastic. The point is to convince people to rethink their habits. A challenge in a country that is the world's second worst defender of plastic ending up in the seas. Lauren Bersicker has more. A treasure trove of bottles, bags and cups entirely made of upcycled plastic. This outdoor exhibition in Indonesia's East Java province seeks to raise awareness on plastic pollution. Its founder hopes it can help change mentalities in a country where single-use plastics are still very much part of everyday life. We want to send a message to the people to stop the use of single-use plastics, from plastic water bottles, plastic bags, straws, packaging, styrofoam and nappies. Those things will later pollute our oceans and the world. The exhibition took three months to assemble, with over 10,000 plastic waste items all collected from Indonesia's polluted rivers and beaches. The museum's centerpiece, a statue of Dewi Sri, a goddess of prosperity widely worshipped in Java, with a skirt entirely made of single-use plastic sachets. A thought-provoking work which visitors say has given them a new perspective on their consumption habits. This makes me want to buy reusable things, like drinking bottles, instead of buying plastic bottles. When I look at all this waste, I feel sad. Around 10% of global ocean plastic pollution comes from Indonesia, making it the world's second biggest contributor to marine waste behind China. The country recently committed to reduce its ocean plastic pollution by 70% by 2025, but a series of regulations to help it reach that goal have so far had limited effects. Every now and then, Netflix has a new hit show. Before, it was Tiger King. Now, it's Squid Game. But the latter is not just the flavor of the month. Squid Game is the most popular show in more than 90 countries and has sparked a craze around the world. Peter O'Brien has more. Netflix's latest jackpot owes part of its fabulous success to the humble Daigona the sweet street treat that's been sold to children in South Korea for 50 years. They're the star of one episode of Squid Game, and here they're being served up by Jung Jung Soon and her husband, Lim Chang Ju, Daigona experts who were enlisted by the show's directors to cook up more than 300 of them on location. Since the show's release, they've been even busier. It's very hectic with so many customers. It's really tough. I came here to buy Daigonas, but I'm giving up because they told me I'd have to wait seven hours. If you can't buy one, make your own. It only takes sugar and bicarbonate of soda, as millions of people are learning from TikTok. In fact, every aspect of Squid Game is being obsessed over. One UK shoe supplier has seen sales for slip-on trainers run up almost 8,000%. That's the footwear worn by contestants in the murderous game depicted in the show. Of course, its striking costumes were bound to provide inspiration for Halloween. Language learning platforms have also recorded a spike in interest in learning Korean. We're getting about a thousand new subscribers a day, so about 30,000 in a month. Squid Game. In Paris, Squid Mania got out of hand after Netflix opened a pop-up promotional shop. Videos posted online documented six-hour queues and even a fist fight outside. 
The streaming platform says the survival drama is the most popular non-English language TV program in the world and will be their biggest show ever, surpassing the 82 million streams of period romance Bridgerton. Well, that's it for this week's Access Asia. Don't forget you can watch this program and others on our website, france24.com. For now, thanks for watching and we'll see you again next time. Consider me your code breaker. Day after day, I'm ready to go on air at any moment to help you make sense of the news we report. I'm here to go live on set with analysis of the most important events of the day, often as they occur, and to provide clarity to our viewers. At France 24, I work closely with the duty editor to give perspective to the big international news stories of the day. My job is to follow international news and current affairs on a daily basis, to better understand and analyse the historical, geopolitical, economic and environmental importance of the world's major news stories. On France 24, in-depth analysis of all the news from our international affairs editors. Liberté, égalité, actualité.